Hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Stallard. I'm the program chair for the EPA. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. He is actually joining us in person. It's awesome from the University of Arizona. Um, Ethan Bond And he's a third year PhD student at the University of Arizona, like I mentioned. Uh, with broad interest in economic geology. Uh, his current work focuses on ore deposits and associated metasomatism and sedimentary rocks uh, of the Colorado Plateau. Eitan utilizes a variety of field and analytical techniques in his work, including lithologic and alteration mapping, geochronology, stable isotope measurement, and various chemical analyses to understand ore forming systems. Prior to his PhD studies, Eitan received an MS in geoscience from the same program and, and also a BS in geology from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, where he devoted his research to the Stockport Bain Zone at the Grassport Porphyry uh, Copper Gold Deposit in Papua. So help me welcome Aton today, and we'll have him talk to us. I also want to thank Steph for getting me out here. Uh, it was nice that I was able to fly out and uh, talk to you guys a little bit about my work in the cool ore deposits in the Paradox Basin. Um, so I me in the Paradox Basin doing some mapping. Uh, to just give you a sense of the kind of things that I do out there. This is the first order scale of observations, boots on the ground, going out there, making the kind of uh, observations and uh, uh, of the of the rocks and cool things within them. Uh, before I dive into my own work, uh, I do want to uh, discuss that this is uh, part of a larger project. Uh, funding has since ended, but uh, it was a, a project funded by the WM Keck Foundation. Uh, called the evolution of crustal paleofluid systems, uh, where we had a bunch of geologists from a few institutions from uh, around the southwest looking at the Paradox Basin uh, for uh, its features like bleaching, mineralization, uh, cool geochronology, uh, pretty innovative stuff, um, uh, and hydrologic modeling associated with the area. Uh, there's a few individuals uh, that uh, are pretty important in this work. I just want to put their names up. And then a group photo uh, from that. Uh, field trip we did in 2021 where we had everyone out there uh, looking at the rocks that uh, we'd all been studying for the past four or five years or so. Okay, on to the good stuff. So, um, before going into the specifics of Paradox Basin, I just want to point out uh, this figure here from Grant Garvin. Uh, it's a pretty standard figure that highlights all the different ways, well, maybe not all of them, but a lot of the different ways in which fluids can move around in sedimentary basins. Um, that involves uh, a lot of different things, like uh, you know, maybe compartmentalization within uh, different parts of the basement, fault-related uh, uh, movement of fluids along those planes, <coughs> weakness, uh, and sort of overpressuring due to uh, loading during uh, compaction. Uh, again, this is just to highlight these things, but it also uh, raises a lot of questions about how we can actually uh, as geologists studied uh, how these uh, different ways of fluid movement manifest in the rock record. Um, I think one of the cooler ways to look at that through the lens of ore deposits, where we have all these cool features where we're concentrating all sorts of metals, uh, among other things, into small areas that uh, 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 gives us the cool and useful critical minerals that we see uh, within basinal environments, among others. Okay. So going along those same lines, another pretty standard figure from Catalyst and Adams, uh, a nice summary diagram of all the different parameters that you might expect uh, to be involved and work in unison to develop the different ore deposits within sedimentary basins. That includes things like uh, temperature, salinity of the fluids involved, uh, different mechanical drivers, so on and so forth. Uh, now the two that I am focused on in this talk today uh, there are two ore deposits that we'll be examining are uranium over here in red and sediment sedimentary rock coasted uh, stratiform deposits, uh, namely the copper, cobalt, silver type things that you see in the Paradox Basin. So you can see that they occupy different parts of this diagram, different drives, different uh, uh, fluid characteristics, so on. Okay, finally getting to the Paradox Basin. Uh, you guys are from Utah, so a lot of you might already be familiar with the area, but uh, we are in the Four Corners area, so Utah, Colorado, Arizona, Mexico. Um, the basin outline is here in this dashed line. Uh, it's a Pennsylvanian-aged foreland basin, uh, uh, terrestrial foreland basin, 
uh, that's defined by the extent of the evaporites that were deposited 300 plus million years ago. Within that area, uh, there's a lot of other superimposed features on those rocks, uh, things like bleaching, which I've highlighted here in this light yellow color. Uh, there's uh, uh, oligocene, roughly aged uh, intrusive features highlighted with these red uh, things. There are salt walls, a whole lot of things in a small area. Makes it kind of difficult to work out a lot of the, uh, the geology because there's so much going on, but it makes for really cool, uh, cool topics of study. Uh, the things that I'm more interested though are looking at the, the natural resources that are present in this area, the hydrocarbons and the mineral deposits that include again, the uranium and vanadium and the copper, silver, and also cobalt. So those things I've highlighted here uh, in this map, where we have mineral districts of uh, uranium and vanadium deposits uh, in these blues and, and purples, the blues representing districts where uh, uranium is hosted in Jurassic age rocks, uh, the purple being uh, Triassic hosted rocks that uh, carry all these metals within. On top of that, there's also these little green diamonds that represent all of the, uh, the copper deposits that you could find within the Paradox Basin. Uh, furthermore, there's also these uh, brown fields. Uh, these are modern hydrocarbon uh, extractive regions, uh, but in addition to that, there's also these paleo reservoirs that were once present within the, within the basin as well. Um, gives you a sense of sort of the, the time scales that we're working on here, all the way from 300 million years ago to the present that these things might be happening. So a lot of the work I've done, uh, at least in the field, is based on the mapping I've done out there. Uh, but I also have had the chance to take a lot of these rocks back into the lab with me, uh, do a lot of interesting analytical work with the microprobe, uh, the electron microscope, borog geochemistry, and pretty new and cool uh, uranium-led geochronology. Um, I try to find links among these different uh, mineralizing systems. Uh, the most important one in my mind being the carbonates, uh, the ones that are uh, co-genetic with the mineralization, as well as some of the things that might be superimposed on them as well. A lot of that work has been done right along the state border here in the what is known as the LaSalle district that has a lot of the things characteristic of the Paradox Basin uh, in a small area, more bite-sized for a PhD student. Uh, uh, rather than trying to traverse this massive area here. So I'm going to start with the Morrison uranium system, um, jumping right into the, to the uranium part of this talk. So this is the Jurassic uh, Morrison formation uh, basin extent here in this sort of tannish color. Uh, all those blue blobs are the outcrops of the formation, and the pink uh, being all the different deposits that you might find uh, uh, within these rocks. Uh, so this was deposited much later in the Paradox Basin, but as you can see, there's a significant area where these two uh, basins overlap, roughly in this area here. Um, these rocks are dominated by fluviatile uh, type sediments, um, and those that host the ore uh, in the southern part of the uh, Morrison Basin, part of the Westwater Canyon member, where we see this big cluster of deposits here. But the focus of this talk, of course, is in the Paradox Basin, where the salt wash member of the, uh, of the Morrison Formation uh, is the dominant host rock of these, of these deposits. I'm going to take you down in scale bit by bit so you can get a sense uh, from large to small what these things look like. Uh, so starting here in this box, take you to a map, uh, the area, uh, central part of the Paradox Basin. You see where Moab there is in the Spanish Valley. Um, but I'm just going to walk you through this really quickly. Uh, so here is the outline of one of the larger uh, uranium and vanadium mineral districts uh, in the Paradox Basin in this bold black color here. Um, on top of that, we can see all the little uranium deposits in these black diamonds. There's some paleo flow indicators uh, from USGS folks that uh, we're trying to measure uh, which way these uh, river drainage systems might have been moving. And then in red here, we've got contours of uh, uh, uranium and vanadium production from mostly the mid 1900s. But it gives you a sense that uh, there's a reason that this thing might have been following sort of this arcuate uh, uh, district here. Um, you know, the, the 
tonnage seems to be the most right in the center of this area. And it, it raises questions concerning, okay, this kind of looks like maybe a fluvial fan type environment. Maybe that's important uh, and a plausible explanation for why there's so much uh, mineralization in this area. There's uh, excellent fluid pathways for these things in these fluvial environments. And there's even uh, this area here known as the LaSalle trend again, that might have been an ancient uh, paleo river system that's turning roughly orthogonal to this more broader, larger producing district there. Do you mind using your mouse? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, just for a sense of scale here, um, this is at the same scale. This is the Eurovan trend again, that arcuate shape. Uh, I put a question mark on where this LaSalle channel system might have been uh, potentially feeding into that sort of broad fluvial plain there. And then over here on the right is the Kosi River fluvial megafan. Although it's a different uh, tectonic uh, uh, environment, since it's draining the Himalayans, uh, it is a, an excellent sort of shape and size analog uh, for something that might have been draining parts of the Western US, you know, 150 million years ago, give or take. Uh, within these environments, again, these deposits uh, are very closely associated with these sandstone channel fill deposits. Um, and then there's also a lot of uh, uh, mudplain, um, sorry, floodstone, sorry, floodplain <laughs> mudstones uh, uh, locally associated with these things that might have, again, provided uh, sort of bounding for pathways within these uh, uh, ancient environments for fluids to move through. Again, jumping into the LaSalle district, take you to a geologic map of the area. This is what I think is an excellent area to be studying these things uh, because there's so many features of the Paradox Basin within such a small area. On the left-hand side, we've got the LaSalle uh, Mountains that represent those Oligocene intrusive phases within the basin. Um, you've got the uh, uranium deposits uh, spanning this definitively narrow trend across the area. Uh, you've got the salt walls uh, that are characteristic of the region, in this case, the Paradox Valley. Uh, there's also a couple of copper deposits that I'll go into in a little bit. Um, but yeah, this is just an excellent area to be studying these things, given the exposure and access that we have uh, in the area. Next level of detail, I'm going to take you into this box here, where we can see uh, some of the distribution of the uh, drilling that uh, groups like the Energy Fuels Group has been doing uh, among others and we can see that their drilling is pretty targeted um, and the, the pattern of where we see well mineralized holes uh, best delineated with these uh, yellow dots here that describes the foot grade of the uh, uranium within them shows a pattern that is uh, very reminiscent of what you might expect a, a river might be in plan view so it's got nice meanders in the central part of it uh, I can't find my cursor, but there's also potentially trunks of different channels joining, maybe distributaries, tributaries. So again, very reminiscent of what uh, might be controlling the mineralization here, given the fluvial environment that these things uh, are hosted, or the rocks are hosted in. Within that, in this white box, uh, there was some drilling in 2019. I had a chance to actually uh, log these in detail. Uh, so I could actually look at the rocks and get a sense of what uh, fresh uh, samples might look like and see um, at hand specimen scale and finer uh, what is actually going on. Uh, so within that box, again, this is just to point out uh, all the drilling that was done here. Again, you might uh, find yourself comparing this uh, once more by looking at these closed circles here in black uh, and, and find yourself thinking again about uh, fluvial environments in which they're deposited. But the key takeaway is that uh, there's this small area here in the central part with these numbered triangles that represent the 20 drill holes that I had a chance to log in great detail and get a sense for uh, what's going on in those rocks. So at that next level, I'm gonna take you and actually look at those rocks. Uh, this uh, photo here on the right is what a few of those drill cores actually look like. Uh, we've got white rocks. Here, uh, those are potentially bleached, and uh, and the protoliths potentially being these red rocks here, uh, separated by things like 
green and red mudstones that are similarly uh, have experienced metasomatism that turned them from red to green. The logging shown here on the left uh, denotes some of the features that I was able to find and uh, uh, find trends among. Uh, there's cements represented by these open circles here. Uh, there are carbonates, perone dolomites to be more specific. Uh, there's a fair amount of pyrite in these things, now weathered to uh, sort of the limonitic rusty red color. Um, and then, of course, sort of these first order observations of just the color of the rocks and the close association that uh, things in black that are uranium and vanadium bearing uh, and their relationship with things that are white or bleached and potentially had their uh, more uh, iron oxide uh, mineral assemblage converted to things like uh, pyrites. And, and other uh, ferrous iron phases. So a lot of the changes that we're seeing in these rocks are actually uh, mineralogical. I do have a couple of whole rock analyses just as an example of that, where we have these red rocks here having about 2% uh, iron oxide in them. And then similarly, 2%, I don't think that the, the 0.07 is much of a statistical difference between the two. But uh, yeah, that conversion of the, the valence state of the iron might be the key thing here, rather than removal of the iron from the, from the rock uh, wholesale that would result in those color changes. And this is just one example of the, uh, the chemical uh, continuity, I guess you might have between rocks that have uh, uh, experienced different kinds of metasomatism within uh, this district and the scale of the basin as well. Just jumping right back out to that map to take you to the next place uh, where there's excellent surface exposures in LaSalle Canyon on the east side of the district, specifically the Morning Star Mine in that red box there. We can actually uh, do some pretty cool surface outcrop mapping. Um, I'll go into what those colors mean in a moment, but just know that the dark areas, again, are the areas that contain uranium in them, and the white areas are sort of these barren host rocks. But I just want to point out, uh, we can take a lot of interesting measurements from these rocks, uh, looking at the different ore sets uh, within the cross in these sandstones, and get a sense for the direction that these uh, that the rivers depositing these sediments might have been flowing 150 million years ago. So even at the scale of this uh, ore body, this singular ore body, we can see this based on a quick uh, stereographic analysis, uh, based on methods uh, from Giselle's uh, 1980, I think, we can see that uh, just like the, the trend of the district going from east to west, or, or west to east, uh, even the ore bodies uh, themselves uh, have rocks in them that were moving in, that had waters moving in roughly the same direction. Uh, onto the more uh, superimposed features, I would say, uh, within these rocks. Again, uh, I've provided the image here on the right to give you a sense of what uh, those rocks might look like given just describe them to you and what uh, they represent uh, on this map so this black mudstone uh, is similar to the things you might see here in these dark gray uh, polygons uh, however these are black sandstones instead so coarser grained equivalent but similarly mineralized these white sandstones uh, being uh, the things we see sort of distal to the ore body. Um, and then uh, the green mudstones in that upper right corner uh, overlaying this ore body here um, in the central portion of the area that was being mapped. So again, sort of black mudstones within the ore body and black sandstones. There's other features mapped in addition to that uh, with these uh, cross hash patterns and, and uh, line patterns here. So just to step you through these really quickly, those blue cross hatches represent um, the development of orthogenic quartz or quartz overgrowths. Pretty common feature uh, in in rocks that have been diagenetically altered. Uh, but in the central part of the ore body, where these things are cross hatched as opposed to single hatched uh, on the fringes here, uh, there's a much more uh, intensive growth of these quartz cements. So just a quick image of what that looks like at the microscopic scale. So outside of the ore body, you see sort of these corroded grains, uh, not much growing on the exteriors of them. But once you step into the ore body, 
you can see the outline of that detrital quartz is actually preserved um, by the uranium minerals that grew along the outsides of them. And those themselves are encased within sort of these nicely euhedral uh, uh, quartz, uh, orthogenic quartz on top of that. In addition to that, these orange lines represent uh, uh, the uh, carbonate cements that were inside of them. Uh, you can see that uh, there's very little of that within the ore body itself, uh, but the second you step outside of it into the white rocks, it's much more abundant. Uh, there's other uh, cements um, that were noted while mapping out there, uh, namely the carbonates, different kind of carbonate, which I'll show you an image of in a moment. Uh, but these things are the ferrone dolomites that I mentioned earlier in the drill uh, logging. Uh, they look like these brown spherical features in uh, an outcrop uh, due to the weathering that they've experienced, uh, where iron is basically coming out and uh, uh, turning it to color. Within the ore body, you don't really get those. Instead, you get uh, things of a similar shape, but different uh, mineralogical composition. So these black cements are actually made up of uranium minerals like uraninite, uh, uh, coffinite and montrazite. And again, you don't see those the second you step outside of the ore body uh, into the sort of barren host rocks. To do a quick summary of what we can see um, mapping these things uh, at the Morning Star uranium vanadium mine. Here's an image of what it looked like in the outcrop. Um, in the white or bleached zones, um, the, there's bleaching present throughout all different kinds of rocks, uh, from mudstone uh, to uh, coarse grain sandstones. There's very little uh, uh, development of uh, orthogenic quartz in there. Um, and the, the spherical concretions that uh, dominate the mineralogy or are dominated by a carbonate mineralogy here. Going into the ore body, where the rocks become more gray and mineralized. Uh, these things are pretty closely associated with channel fill sand deposits. Uh, there's abundant quartz overgrowths in there. Carbonates are mostly absent, uh, though still very important for understanding the system. Um, and the concretions or spherical cements that we're seeing are made up of uh, uranium and vanadium minerals instead of carbonates. So another uh, level of scale we're moving down. Um, I mentioned before those uh, carbonate concretions. Uh, mostly from dolomites outside the ore bodies. Um, there's also calcite within the, the ores. Um, I put up an a X-ray map from our SEM here, give you a sense of what the relationship is between those two kinds of minerals or two kinds of carbonates rather. So associated with minerals like pyrite highlighted by these green blobs and uh, coffinite highlighted by the red here. Um, those are the cements that uh, uh, are associated with the calcite here in blue. And then overgrowing all that and apparently a paragenetically later mineral assemblage is this sort of light greenish blue ferrone dolomite cement that uh, uh, gives us a sense for the timing of the growth of these different minerals. But if we can assume that the calcite that uh, is present with the pyrite and the, uh, the coffinite, uh, was uh, coeval with these other minerals, and maybe we can get a sense from what the carbonate uh, uh, contains for uh, the different geochemical environments that these things were forming in. So, uh, had the chance to go with the, uh, spend some time with our electron microprobe and get some measurements of what those different carbonates uh, contained. Uh, so, the areas. Uh, and I'm going to highlight on this ternary diagram of calcite, magnesite, and siderite are mainly in these regions here and in this region here. The points in this area here are from the, uh, the carbonate cements that did not contain any uranium minerals within them. And they're very clearly compositionally distinct from those that did have uranium minerals within them. Uh, these things are more dolomitic, not pure dolomites, though, given the uh, increased iron content within them, you'd expect the real dolomite to plot something like right here. And then when you compare them to uh, uh, the calcites that actually contain uranium uh, minerals within them, they look to be nearly pure calcites. Um, those that uh, 
uh, do have uranium minerals within them, also have a fair amount of manganese as well, uh, which I have highlighted here with the uh, color gradients associated with these different points. So that's cool and all, but uh, why am I saying this? There's cool things we can learn from the different chemical compositions of these things. Uh, so one of those being the relative redox state of the uh, environment in which uranium precipitated. Uh, that's dependent on things like the manganese to iron ratios in there, uh, which I highlighted previously on that diagram, where you might have had a higher manganese to iron ratio associated with the uh, cements that were uh, growing with uranium minerals. Uh, those might have been potentially more oxidized than things that formed uh, with a, a much lower iron content to them. Uh, there's also uh, an indication from the high magnesium content of some of the, the minerals or of some of the carbonates that did not have uranium in them for uh, uh, conate or evaporitic waters. Uh, remember, we're in, in the Paradox Basin region where there's a whole lot of uh, underlying evaporite minerals where magnesium might have been coming up uh, during circulation within the basin. And there's also a potential for understanding very roughly what the uh, temperature of formation might have been uh, given the magnesium content of these things. So I just pulled this diagram really quickly from Bert Walter uh, that shows um, a pretty clear relationship between an increased uh, magnesium content in carbonates and the temperatures at which uh, they form. So these sort of diamond shaped things uh, precipitated uh, at maybe 45 degrees Celsius uh, have a much higher magnesium content relative to things that uh, precipitated at much cooler temperatures around five degrees Celsius um, that had, again, much lower magnesium content. Continuing along the lines of those carbonates, um, we can actually measure the stable isotopes of both carbon and oxygen within these minerals to get a sense of uh, uh, where they might plot uh, relative to other fields that are characteristic of certain environments like uh, hydrocarbon-related reservoirs or, uh, or potentially things that uh, resemble modern waters, both deep and at the surface within the Paradox Basin. So my measurements are here in these white dots. So again, we can see a little bit of difference in the chemical composition between things that uh, are more thrown dolomites that do not contain uranium and those in these triangles here that do. Uh, the ones that do contain uranium um, are slightly heavier in, in the oxygen space uh, that might indicate you know, potential involvement again with uh, uh, a more uh, uh, evaporitic source water uh, in their formation uh, relative to things that might have been lighter uh, in their oxygen composition. We can also reconstruct things uh, or we can reconstruct the waters and their stable isotope composition uh, using uh, sort of these calibrations that have been well established for a long time now to get a sense of what the waters might have looked like that form these things. Uh, so if you reconstruct uh, the waters that formed all the measurements that I did at 100 degrees C, they overlap uh, with a range of modern paradox basin conate waters. Again, this might give you a sense of what, uh, of what might have been involved in the formation of these things. And then also, if you do it at 25 degrees C, something that might re resemble more of a superficial water, they do, in fact, look like things that uh, you can find in, in shallow aquifers or at the surface today within the Paradox Basin. So a little bit ambiguous there, but at least it gives you some idea of what, uh, what might have been involved in, in making these things. Given that uh, we're interpreting the carbonates as uh, uh, minerals that grew along with the uranium minerals, might be able to actually date them using uh, innovative new geochronology um, to get a sense of when the timing was that these things formed. So it's a pretty hot topic in, in the geochron sphere right now. Uh, people are dating carbonates using a, a method that maps out the uranium content within these things. So this top image here, uh is just made by running a razor a, a laser and rastering it over the carbonate mineral um, i put a color scale here for the uranium content of these things you can see that uh, the, the calcite actually contains upwards of a thousand parts per million uh, uranium in them uh, and then we can 
look at the uranium lead uh, ratios in these in, in the same minerals and plot those things up on what's called the Tara Wasserberg diagram that gives you uh, uh, an age of formation for these things. So in both cases, they're roughly early Cretaceous, which is just after deposition of, uh, of the, the rocks that hosted them, those being the fluvial salt wash member in the Jurassic Morrison Formation. And interestingly, this also happens to be a time in which there is no deposition. There's a big unconformity uh, that was forming uh, during the time that these supposedly uh, grew. The group at UA has also been developing uh, uh, or has developed a potassium argon uh, lab that lets us date some of the minerals that contain potassium in them. Uh, the most notable ones in these ore bodies being things like vanadium illite uh, and potentially some more uh, weathering related minerals like granal vanadase such as uh, carnitite and tiamonite. So both contain, contain potassium uh, which provides us with uh, this material to actually be doing uh, the geochronology here with, uh, the first of which, sorry, is that uh, vanadium elite, this sort of hairy looking mineral here, and then these nice bright green colors being maybe those weathering related uh, potassium bearing things. So we plot those up, uh, just on a basic uh, uh, diagram here that shows the size fractions that were separated out from this sample. Uh, we can see that there's a definite mode of uh, of ages, roughly in the Eocene here, uh, between 36 and 42 MA. Uh, that's pretty similar to a lot of other uh, faulting that's been dated within the basin and potentially bleaching within the basin as well. Uh, that's attributed to uh, the vanadium illite that's within these rocks. And then the other potassium bearing mineral, again, the tiamonite, among other things, uh, is supposedly the source of the, the younger age here at 4.6 MA. That is during the same time as exhumation or uh, uplift of the Colorado Plateau. Now, just for context, uh, this is a, a chart from some of my colleagues at UA. Uh, it's a big compilation diagram of a lot of the geochronology that's uh, been, been used in this region for many years now. Uh, but again, uh, Putting mine in the context of that, we can see that in the Paradox Basin, there's actually not a lot of uh, geochron that suggests that there's uh, uranium mineralization going on in the, this time period that I'm proposing here in the early Cretaceous. But there is significant overlap with some of the other ages produced from uh, the fault gouge and other bleaching related features within the Paradox Basin as well. But lastly, there's this younger age here. Uh, towards the end of the, uh, or closer to present day, um, where there's a, a fair amount of uh, manganese oxide and iron oxide dating uh, that get, that's again related to the exhumation of the plateau. Okay, done with the, uh, the uranium system. I hope, uh, I hope that was somewhat enlightening for you. Uh, we're gonna move on to the Paradox Copper System. Uh, so this is a map of uh, a zoomed in area within the northern part of the basin where we have a lot of those beautiful salt walls, present day being uh, these, these nice valleys, uh, including Spanish Valley again, where Moab is. Um, and then again in green, the green diamonds uh, are all of the uh, copper deposits, uh, not all of them, but a comprehensive list of, of the, some of the copper deposits that have been found within the basin. These are primarily hosted in sandstones, but not limited to the kinds that we saw uh, earlier where they're all fluvial. You can have these things, eolianites uh, and mudstones and a whole lot more. Um, there's a close association with the salt walls, as you can see, or at least some of the faulting associated with fault walls, uh, given that uh, a lot of these diamonds are either in, along, or around things, uh, the faults in the salt walls themselves. And there's potentially uh, overlap with uh, some of the organic matter within the basin, uh, namely the uh, hydrocarbon fields that we could see here in brown. So just quickly looking at those faults and serenets uh, associated with them that uh, that contain copper. Um, these, uh, th there's two kinds of faults that they're associated with, one being the, uh, the ones that parallel the salt walls, 
uh, such as in the southern part of the Lisbon Valley uh, anticline here. Uh, we can see that a lot of the, the veins that contain copper in them are roughly uh, salt wall parallel, similar to the trend of the, the basin. And then zooming in right here, known as the Cashin mine, there are these transverse faults which run roughly orthogonal to those major trends within the basin and pretty clearly show uh, some similarity between sort of those copper veins and copper bearing fractures uh, to, to the faults themselves. Beyond that, I just wanted to show a quick few photos of what uh, the, how the copper actually manifests within these rocks. Um, there's a lot of really cool features uh, that uh, are contained within these things. I'll just go through a few. Um, these are taken from a bunch of different mines from around the basin. Uh, but these things contain a lot of disseminated mineralization, namely calcocyte that weathers to these beautiful uh, blues and greens characteristic of malachite and azurite. Uh, there's a lot of veining in there, which I've mentioned uh, before with the stereonets and their orientations. Uh, the Buckeye Mine contains these beautiful calcocyte veins that weather to, again, those malachite greens. Uh, at the Sunrise Mine, we have these massive uh, calcite veins, a uh, whole lot of interesting compositions in there. Uh, some of them end up being pretty iron rich, uh, given their, giving them their characteristic brown hues. And then there's these beautiful breccias uh, from places like Lisbon Valley and uh, Blue Chief Mines, where we can see class of the original host rock basically torn up and tossed around within these calcite and uh, barite matrix, as well as a barite and calcocyte matrix here on the left. Um, so jumping in, looking at the uh, the cache in mine, which I showed that stereo stereo net from earlier. Um, just want to point out some of the, the the mapping I've done here, namely again to look at the sort of the metasomatic features superimposed on these rocks. Uh, a lot of this is built off of some earlier work by my colleagues John Thorson and Tim McIntyre that uh, that denoted this pretty interesting relationship between bleaching in rocks like the Jurassic Cayenta Formation, uh, denoted by the whites and the reds, and uh, and the hydrocarbons within them, as well as the copper mineralization. So just real quick, the geology uh, in the deeper parts of this canyon here, you've got Triassic Chinle formation, and that extends up through a whole bunch of terrestrial deposits uh, all the way up into actually areas that are capped by, again, the Jurassic Forest formation. So within that, we see these sort of oddball blobs of bleaching within these rocks uh, that leave behind some of these oddly shaped uh, uh, areas where the rocks are still red or the original host rock color. These things might look kind of weird on here, but they're actually just following mostly bedding planes. Um, and given that this is sort of deeply incised uh, country, these things sort of follow these strange uh, linear trends in there. So on top of that, just looking in at the zoomed area where I did some uh, more detailed mapping, um, there's some pretty interesting features here, uh, similar to those that uh, we saw in the uranium mine. So along these redox boundaries that separate the red from the white Jurassic Pianta formation, uh, there's these uh, concretions similar to those that we saw uh, in the barren uh, host rocks of the uh, salt wash. There's also uh, a lot of interesting uh, calcocyte, azurite, malachite concretions that are right along this caching fault here which is supposedly the uh, ore controlling uh, uh, fault in the area. There's also wholesale replacement of the rocks by pyrite, uh, denoted with these orange blobs. And then in these larger uh, uh, circular areas, uh, we see uh, things where there's sort of these large pyrite halos that are now weathered to these bright oranges and browns. I'm going to show you a few photos just so you can get a sense of what that looks like. So right along the fault, uh, we have one of these sort of pyrite replacement uh, uh, areas. Uh, all this brown and orange uh, is not the original rock color. That would look more something like this white area here. Uh, but instead, there's all sorts of iron addition to these rocks, uh, as well as some copper, which is denoted by these green colors. Those concretions I mentioned right along the redox boundary there look like this. Again, very similar 
uh, in in uh, in view to the ones we saw in uranium mine. But these things have a totally different relationship bleaching and mineralization that we saw that we see um, at the cash and copper mine. And then lastly, uh, we see those cool copper or sorry, these cool pyrite halos. They are sometimes along joints and sometimes not. I'm still working out what exactly those mean, uh, but uh, potentially related to diagenesis of the rocks. Who knows at this point? On top of all of that, uh, I have a layer of this map that shows the different vein sets. Uh, similar, uh, these are the things that were plotted up on the stereo net earlier. Uh, the main thing being the changes in mineralogy that we see as you move up and down the system. So here, uh, closer to these adits, where there was a lot of mining for the copper, uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, copper bearing veins, of course. Uh, these things also contain calcite and barite. Uh, but as you move up higher into the system, higher structural levels, higher stratigraphy, uh, we see veins that are dominated just by pyrite. Just some quick examples of what that looks like. And here's those veins following that roughly northeast southwest trend, copper bearing, and in lower parts of the system. And then as you move up, they're dominated by pyrite, but still following that same trend. Might give us a sense for uh, 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 how much copper is being lost or precipitated out the higher you are up uh, from, from the, the fluids that might have been migrating up along the fault. Again, we can look at the chemistry of the carbonates that are associated with these uh, uh, the copper minerals. Um, the main thing to take away from this is that uh, there's a lot of different deposits within copper deposits within the paradox basin, and they're all fairly compositionally distinct. Uh, the, they're mostly dolomites at the uh, at the Cashin mine, and these contrast greatly from the more calcitic uh, uh, bearing things um, in other parts of the basin, uh, all within a very small area, but very compositionally different. I've also put up uh, the measurements of those concretions that were mapped right along that redox boundary at Cashin. Uh, and this is just to point out that in an even smaller area, there's still compositional difference between them as well. And just for reference, this is where those uh, salt wash furrow and dolomites would plot. Uh, again, very different uh, uh, composition that we might find at Cashin. Again, giving us a sense for what, uh, what different processes or different uh, fluid mechanisms might have been involved in the formation of these things. Same thing at the top, uh, there's a U or related calcite that plots in a totally different area than most of the calcites from the copper deposits. Just quickly looking again at the stable isotopes of the uh, calcites that contain copper in them. Um, this is a plot here on the left of the oxygen composition of these things um, within, the, within the minerals themselves. On the right, would be what uh, uh, modern waters uh, within the paradox basin would look like. And uh, we can actually, again, do that reconstruction exercise to see what these things, what the, the calcite formational waters might have looked like at various temperature ranges. So based on some fluid inclusion work done here at the University of Utah um, in the 80s, uh, there's a good guess that these uh, copper uh, deposits formed at temperatures maybe roughly 100 to 125 degrees C. So reconstructing where that uh, orange range of compositions is to where the uh, 100 degree isotherm is and plotting that against modern uh, 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 water compositions, we can see that there's a pretty pretty strong similarity to what the, the brines coming out of the water, out of the uh, oil and gas uh, wells look like. And then, Again, just for reference, comparing them to what the uranium-related uh, uh, cements look like, uh, which probably formed at much lower temperatures. They, again, look like things that overlap with the modern surface and groundwaters. So although they look uh, pretty similar at first glance, there are cool ways in which we can sort of tease them apart and make them more compositionally distinct. Again, a lot of cool uh, geochronology coming out of the University of Arizona. Um, and specifically the uh, calcites, uh, namely those that are intergrown with the copper minerals. So I put, I put up a couple photos just to convince you that these things probably formed at roughly the same time uh, from the Lisbon Valley mine 
there are calcites intergrown with these beautiful calcopyrites. And then at the Cashin line, which I showed you those maps from, we've got those dolomites intergrown with things like boronite, digenite, and calcopyrite, all copper bearing. Here's that compilation again. There are some ages, rhenium osmium ages from the Lisbon Valley boronite that again plot pretty similarly uh, to uh, those ages at fault in the Paradox Basin. But my ages being produced uh, using that uh, uranium lead calcite uh, method are pretty distinct from those that uh, have been previously published. Uh, so they plot in this roughly mid to late Miocene time span, which again is not when uh, it appears that there's a lot of faults moving uh, within the basin, but this could potentially represent a different kind of uh, faulting style or faulting event compared to those that were producing these potassium argon ages. So just to give you a sense of the spatial and temporal distribution of these ages, I put up a histogram on the left here that shows the ranges in ages from 3 million years ago to about 17, 18 million years ago. There's a distinct mode here in the middle around 11 to 14 MA. And then over here on the right is the distribution of where these uh, ages are coming from, from around the Paradox Basin. Again, all of these things are uh, associated with faulting and veining in these uh, uh, copper forming environments. So you might be asking yourself, uh, what's going on with these ages, Aton? Uh, no one's published anything related to the timing of mineralization in those time periods. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through a couple of things that were going on at the same time as that. So within the Western US, beginning at about 40, 50 MA, Extension started in the Great Basin, but I'm jumping straight to a uh, time period here on the left uh, at about, 20, starting at about 24 MA. Uh, just for context, here's the Paradox Basin and the Colorado Plateau. We can see that between 24 and about 6 MA in this panel on the right, there's a whole lot of movement going on to the west. Not so much on the Colorado Plateau, but at least we have a sense that things were active, tectonically active uh, uh, within the modern Cordillera. In addition to that, uh, there's a lot of things happening with the landscape on the Colorado Plateau. Uh, you're probably pretty familiar with the Colorado River that was actively incising, um, if you believe, Carl Kallstrom, uh, beginning at about 11 MA. Um, again, another, another time period that overlaps well with my proposed uh, ages of copper mineralization. So what gives, what, what's the relationship between those things and, and my rocks? Salt, salt gives. Salt is one of the we weakest uh, geologic materials out there. Uh, you can see how it compares to things um, like quartzites and shales, among other things, and how easy, it, uh, or how weak they are, and easy to fracture compared to these stronger materials. So, some other work from uh, colleagues at UA uh, showed that in and around salt walls, it's pretty easy to get things to break and joint. Uh, a lot of evidence for jointing around these things. Um, uh, Lauren Reher has put up uh, a nice diagram here of what uh, what fracturing might have been going on uh, during the Laramide time period. If we just flip those arrows, I might get a sense for what the state of stress might have been at that time and uh, how it might have affected the, the rocks surrounding salt walls um, and potentially uh, the fractures that uh, were hosting copper. In addition to that, some work by a colleague Steve Lingry uh, has shown that uh, between the Eocene and now, there's been tons of, of rock eroded away uh, from the anticlines within the region. Um, this includes things all the way up in the Wasatch Formation, uh, but the thickest of quartz being the Mancos, easiest to remove. Uh, also happens to be an aquaclude uh, that might have been uh, preventing fluids from circulating in and around these areas and might have been introducing uh, waters that were involved in mineralization into lower stratigraphic or structural levels. So bombarded you with a lot of information, um, but there are some key takeaways I want you to leave this room with. Um, the main question driving this study being, how can we study ore deposits and how can they lend us some information 
about geology in the Heronox Basin. Um, so the distribution of these uh, of these ore deposits we're looking at uh, uh, is dependent on the types of fluid systems that they're associated with. Uh, in the case of the uranium deposits, uh, it appears that there's a, a large control by the uh, original fluvial networks that they're that the rocks they're hosted in or deposited by. And in the case of copper and silver mineralization, uh, they appear to be localized by salt-related faults um, that uh, uh, were maybe releasing fluids in and around those salt walls and, and faults themselves. Uh, there's a lot to learn from the geochemistry of these things as well. Uh, there's compositionally uh, distinct carbonates uh, in both of these systems, both between them and within them. Uh, I showed you examples of calcites associated with uranium and those that were not. And then we can look at the oxygen stable isotope compositions, uh, which might give you a sense for what the uh, uh, variability might have been in the fluids that were involved in each of these environments. And finally, the new geochronology here um, gives you context uh, for when these uh, mineralizing systems were active and how they uh, might be related to other things going on, both within the basin and beyond. So with that, thank you for listening and having me and all of my uh, co-authors and colleagues back at UA and everywhere else. Okay.